Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Valdez Heverisha, and I manage the AgriFin webinar series on agricultural finance here at the World Bank. Um, as you may know, the AgriFin webinar series is a monthly event uh, which features lessons on agricultural finance from practitioners around the world. Um, I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Michael Andrade, Senior Vice President and Business Head of Agriculture, uh, of Agriculture at HDFC Bank in India. Um, Michael has given several presentations for us uh, in the past and was one of the volunteer faculty members of, for the AgriPen Bootcamp on Agricultural Banking, uh, where he lectured on agricultural value chain finance. Um, Michael's contribution to the Bootcamp has been critical, and I'm really happy to say that six out of the seven participating banks were able to launch new products as a result of the knowledge gained during the boot camp. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that this is really a rare occasion for all of us to hear from someone with such an incredible amount of practical banking experience of over 22 years, um, especially, um, you know, a, a very uh, uh, in-depth knowledge of the uh, agricultural value chain finance. So I encourage everyone to take this opportunity after Michael's presentation to ask uh, Michael any technical questions that you may have. Um, we also have a LinkedIn group where you can post your questions and we'll work with Michael to try to answer all of them uh, in the case uh, in case we do not have enough time to, to address all of the questions here. Um, so you can join the group now uh, through the link that uh, my colleague Rebecca um, will post shortly or has already posted on the chat box uh, below. So Michael's presentation will highlight HDFC's experience in developing an innovative approach to finance uh, the dairy farmers in India, uh, utilizing the relationship of farmers with buyers. Uh, Michael will start by providing a brief overview of the dairy value chain financing model. Uh, he will also um, talk about how the bank identifies and builds relationships with the key value chain actors, uh, as well as uh, um, talk about pro the processes for loan appraisal, uh, loan approval, and, and monitoring, as well as uh, the overall lessons that the bank has learned so far in, uh, on this subject. So um, we will start with Michael's presentation, which will be around uh, 25 minutes. Uh, and this will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. Um, you don't have to wait until the end to ask your questions. We, we, can, we can receive your questions through the chat box or the Q&A box uh, on WebEx. And I encourage you to write your questions throughout the presentation um, using these two, uh, two tools. So the chat box is located in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, unfortunately, in order to preserve sound quality, we cannot allow the use of microphone uh, among participants. But I will do my best to collect all of the questions and ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, and, uh, and just uh, lastly, before we start with the presentation, we will also conduct a brief survey at the end of the presentation in order to find out uh, what you thought about today's webinar and, and the presentation. So I really encourage you to complete the survey at the end of the webinar, as it, it helps us to understand better the, the value that these presentations are adding to your, uh, to your work. So uh, with that, I, I am uh, happy to welcome Michael and, uh, and invite him to start the presentation. Hey everyone. Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, and good evening in this part of the world. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, financing of smallholder farmers through value chains, specifically related to, uh, in this presentation, the dairy sector. This, uh, these value chains and the proposition of value chains for financing agriculture was not exactly how we had uh, thought about it, but it evolved as a, a very uh, productive, viable, successful model to manage smallholder farmers, uh, specifically in dairy because of the short uh, turnaround daily milk cycles 
uh, we've had uh, early uh, learnings, early successes. Uh, we also have value chains in other crop uh, areas, but as you know, each crop cycle varying from six, three to six months. Uh, so we need to have a couple of more crop cycles in other field crops before we can talk about those in more detail. So here's uh, with the dairy value chain. Now, just to give you a background of farmer profiles in India, we have at the top end of this pyramid, farmers with land uh, holding of one hectare and above. Now, this typically uh, in, in the India context, uh, farm lending is SME in nature. So it is collateral based. Individual farmers are assessed based on certain parameters and credit is given. This approach uh, tends to have limitations when we go below uh, certain uh, farm, holder, farm sizes. And the limitations uh, come mainly from the ability to assess these farmers uh, and uh, the ability to collect because the cost of collection from each farmer on each harvest uh, can become quite uh, costly in relative terms to the value of the loan. So looking at some of these limitations and looking at some of the other initiatives that we had done, we ca it came together as a value chain approach uh, to handle small and marginal farmers, smallholder farmers as they're known worldwide. Smallholder farmers, as you know, are highly vul vulnerable and they also uh, viability gets challenged when you look at a SME approach of doing a one-to-one -one loan to each of these farmers. So value chain is a possible solution. Moving on, if you look at the dairy industry or dairy sector in India, it is large. A lot of farmers traditionally keep a few milk cattle uh, for their own consumption and sell the surplus. So that's been the traditional model of milk uh, production in this country. India is the largest producer of milk in the world with, 16, with a 16% share of global production. More than 300 million heads of cattle managed by rural households producing an average of surplus, average surplus of about six liters a day, which, which looks relatively small, but considering part of it is consumed and uh, you know traditional methods of managing cattle, uh, this is what it averages out to. Out of all this milk production, 15% of the milk gets uh, procured or purchased by the organized sector, which consists of the private sector and the cooperatives. Right now, the private sector purchases about 44% of the milk and 54-55% is with the cooperatives. The rest of the 85% of the, of the milk goes through traders uh, and door-to-door -door delivery of milk without uh, any formal organized sector uh, intervention. So the way it works is there, there, are, there are what you call milk collection centers run by milk collection agents and the surplus milk gets poured into these collection centers. And uh, so as far as cooperatives are concerned, they create a membership and the members pour milk at a society level. So this is the broad collection uh, framework of milk. It is not, uh, or, uh, you know, evolved into specific dedicated dairy farms. By and large, this is the way it, it works in India. India also has the largest, uh, is also the largest consumer of milk with consumption growing at over 5%, while production is growing at 3%. So clearly there's a gap, there's huge untapped potential Market access and focus on nutrition can help milk production grow by threefold, at least it is estimated. For reasons such as quality and efficiency of milk uh, procurement, procurement, this industry is expected to move gradually towards mid-sized cattle farms from maybe 10 heads of cattle to upwards to about 100. But this would require some amount of finance and better uh, value chain management. Finance from the organized sector to dairy farmers for purchase of milk is very limited. And that is mainly due to the high risk of frauds and moral hazards of uh, cattle being uh, swapped, sold before the tenor of the loan comes to the end. 
Now, India, as you know, has is, is got a GDP growth of 5 to 6 percent, with agriculture contributing 15 percent. But there is a widening gap between income earned by agricultural households and other households. And this gap is widening. A, a good focus on dairy could be a possible solution of helping some households move out of this uh, income trap and move into higher levels of uh, income generation. So let's look at why we, uh, in a little more detail, why this value chain uh, process for small and smallholder farmers. So limitations of the existing model. This in general concerns all smallholder farmers, not specifically related to dairy. Farmers are expected to manage their own business, similar to other SME customers. The challenge remains of lack of information, high operating costs, and a branch-led model has a restricted distribution. The changing market conditions. Markets are changing, consumers are changing, farmers are not directly connected with these changes. The de demand supply gap, population pressure, food safety, residues, quality, freshness, changing lifestyles and food habits. Then there's a lot of disruption happening, climate change. There are methods to adapt, to prevent, and to minimize the impacts of climate change, but how would small farmers do that on their own? How do you expect them to have knowledge of what is the applicable technology to use for their respective geographies and how to manage uh, weather better? But on the flip side, you have a lot happening on the digital uh, front. Uh, digital banking, fintech, there's technology in terms of farm management. So there's a lot of solutions also possible. How do we put all this together to impact uh, smallholder farms is the value chain uh, process. So how does the value chain actually work in this case? The first and foremost part or key component of, the, of a value chain is the payments. We start with payments, so that in, we need to invest. We invest resources in farmer enrollment, get payments started, payments into the bank account of farmers. Then if you're making payments, you need a cash in, cash out points. So we have set up business correspondence with micro ATMs, ATMs. There's, there's an element of cash delivery from the branch for business correspondence. And using the payments, then we have a cash flow based assessment of loans after a few payment cycles. The second component is the off taker. This is another key component. You need steady buyers who can quote steady prices. Buyers are willing to make payment into farmers' accounts. Buyers with a regular base of suppliers, regular base of farmers. Buyers with credibility and market standing either directly or through the so these buyers would likely be food processors for big food companies, and that, that helps with the credibility of the off-taker. The real key element in a value chain is the aggregator. And the make or break point is this aggregator, generally a lead farmer, uh, and he is not only involved in the aggregation process, managing the infrastructure for the company, he also manages you know, the financial aggregation in this case, he becomes a collection service agent, he becomes a guarantor to, to the borrowers. So a lot, a lot of dependence on this uh, aggregation piece. And then we add on top of all this is the farm extension services, which doubles up as a loan monitoring mechanism and regular data collected through smartphones and analyzed uh, for risk at the back end. So this is the construct of a value chain framework. Let's see how it looks in uh, the dairy model. So the first uh, part to this is the payments, like I explained. So this is what it hap how it happens. There's a company or a processor that makes payments into the farmer accounts through the bank, through a digital upload process. It's straight through processing, no manual intervention here. Farmers get paid. Farmers get paid for milk that is poured into the society through collection agents or through the cooperative society where it gets chilled and waits for the truck to come from the company and the, uh, the truck then carries the milk to the processor. 
We also use this collection agent or society as a business correspondent, wherever they're willing to work as a business correspondent. Where they're not willing to work as a business correspondent, a third party business correspondent has to be evaluated based on the vi uh, you know, assessed viability of the setup of the number of farmers and milk collection volumes and things like that. And then the milk uh, collection society or the collection agent also doubles up as a loan collection agent and a guarantor to the loans in this payment system. So why do we have this element over here? This element is mainly to provide farmers, uh, to prevent farmers from site selling. So this, these people have a good control and are the main influencers of the farmers. And by getting their skin in the game, uh, you have better control on farmers uh, wanting to site sell. But why, why would they do it? They do it because if uh, the main reason they do it is farmers getting more credit for increasing the production cap capacity means higher turnover for them on uh, milk supply to the company, which means higher income on that milk supply to the company. So there is an incentive. Apart from that, there's also uh, an incentive, direct incentive for by, paid by the bank for all these loans and as a collection agent fee. So there's a double incentive here for the society or the collection agent to double up as a guarantor. Then once the payments have started coming in, we get into the lending part of the business where the way it works is the farmer identifies the cattle he wants to purchase. Uh, he messages or fills up his application. Uh, this is picked up by the business correspondent relay to a relationship manager who relays it to the insurance company and this all happens in a matter of a couple of days the, the veterinary doctor comes checks the animal and gives the bank a health certificate and the bank then releases the money for the cattle loans so this is how it all works within a turnaround of one between one and three days the the loan is dispersed uh, through all uh, this uh, paperwork moving in digital fashion so this is where the whole process uh, loan gets generated and dispersed. Now, here, coming back to this element of this aggregation, the key points here is, you know, selecting the right agent or the right society. And also, you know, uh, this would be equivalent to having the right manage, branch manager at a at a remote rural branch. So that's having the right branch manager in, in a branch is make or break a business for that particular branch. So this is equivalent to that, getting the guy to have the right kind of mindset, who will blend in with the culture of the bank, having the right integrity. So there's a bit of learning over here that comes in. And that is really key to this whole business. Uh, you have to constantly keep looking at this, ev evaluating this to make sure that you're going right. And for each geography, you then arrive at what works and what doesn't work. But then mistakes can be made and we can't leave it at in the hands of a collection agent. Going back a step, cattle loans are dispersed directly to the farmer and not through the collection agent. So everything is a direct touch point with the farmer. But then we don't leave it at that. Like I said, we also need to monitor these loans. Now these loans are very small and how much uh, you can't use bank resources to monitor these loans. So we get into a remote monitoring process where you have three, four data points coming into an analytics uh, unit. So you get milk data or payments data that comes in from the bank accounts. You get milk, fat and weight quality data that comes in from the milk collection center through a small device that we have attached to our ATMs and micro ATMs. And you also have, we engaged with certain ground staff who give us uh, an update on the animal's health uh, on a two month basis. Every two months you get an update on that. This data, this is a work in progress. We're trying to put it together and make it settle down. But the idea is that we analyze this data on a regular basis and uh, throw out exceptions for early warnings. The data also goes to the insurance company so they can have a better control on the data, which eventually should lead to 
a better pricing model on insurance of, uh, for the animals. So in short, this is what the model is. How have we progressed so far on the dairy business? So we have over 100,000 farmers receiving payments for milk supplied. Basis the cash flow, 40,000 farmers are already pre-approved for cattle finance and more than 9,800 have availed collateral free cattle finance. They're currently spread out, we're currently spread out against Rajas uh, states of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Punjab, UP, which is largely North India, and now moving into central with Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, and Eastern Bihar. Just give me a second. Yeah, sorry about that. There's a mobile phone ringing in the background. So these 100,000 farmers, there are another 100,000 that are enrolled, enrolled and will, be, uh, will start receiving milk shortly. Currently, 750 business correspondents set up at milk collection points using micro ATMs and at the larger collections uh, societies, we have also put milk ATMs over there, cash dispensers itself. Then there is cross-sell of products that happens. There's deposits, savings, secured farm credit for those larger farmers that are pouring milk, vehicle loans, all to milk farmers. Then the platform is opened up further to other non-dairy uh, customers in the village for things like agricultural and government payments. So leveraging the presence of this business correspondent further, so other rural businesses around the ecosystem comes in and that totally adds up to the viability of this whole unit. So this is tried, tested, working, viable, making profits, and now being put to scale. And the last part is we've learned how to manage these delinquencies through a very detailed selection process. And uh, fortunately for us, the delinquencies have performed much better than expected. So that gives us the confidence to put this whole model to scale. We are looking at uh, at least a thousand crores of cattle loans in the next uh, 18 months, Indian rupees. So what has changed? The existing finance model for cattle was mainly uh, around the agents or cooperatives, but first milk payments received by agents and then paid out in cash uh, to farmers. So there was no handle or no transparency of which farmers got paid what amount. So that has changed now. Milk payments now go directly into the bank account of the farmer. In the old model, cattle finance was done in an aggregated manner to a cooperative or uh, an agent. And there was no visibility on who the borrowers were. And in fact, no visibility on what the end use of those funds were. The, the downside, further downside of that was only credit, credit worthy people uh, societies or agents had access to this kind of finance. So that has changed now. Cattle loans can be offered by to any individual based on his payment cash flows. And it's available to all farmers of a society and available to all societies of all sizes. The bank has, the second, the last, uh, the another point is the bank had to physically collect interest and installments every month, every month in the old model. Now the installments and interest get deducted directly from the milk proceeds, saving a lot of uh, operating costs uh, through this uh, value chain model. And from a customer standpoint of view in the old model, it was only restricted to a group lending of cattle finance and for individual other products, farmers had to move 30, 40 kilometers to the nearest bank branch. Now the business correspondent is able to provide a full range of banking products to, to farmers attached to the dairy point and those who are not attached to the dairy point. And cattle loan on an unsecured basis uh, to individual farmers were just not viable in the old model. Now we have better control. We have better control on what we are financing. We have better control on the end use. As a result, the quality of the book is, has been good and the 
the business as such, the business model is viable. What are the key lessons learned? Farmer loyalty is high when there is a stable market and a trusted off taker. There's transparency and there is technical support. Like I mentioned before, a lot depends on the versatility of the aggregator who now not only uh, has to work uh, for the bank, but he has to face the company. Uh, he's the face of the company to farmers. He has to assure the company a certain amount of produce. He has to take on the risks associated with farmers uh, delivering the right amount of produce. And all other risks between the company and the farmers is in his, in his sits on him. And that's why uh, he becomes a key, key point over here. Developing this aggregation model, I keep stressing, is, is the key to, to any value chain. The last point is most food companies do not deal directly with farmers, but they, they do require quality, certification, sustainability, and traceability. And going forward, things like managing carbon footprint, etc. This is a way that it can be done. And aggregating this in this manner is a possible solution to some of these challenges. So a little about HDFC Bank. HDFC Bank, as you know, is a full service rural bank, apart from being uh, the bank with one of the highest market capitalizations in the world. 55% 50, of the branch network is in rural India, semi-urban and rural India. We have the complete range of products offered across uh, the broad spectrum of urban, rural, and semi-urban India. There is no differentiation in the offerings. The service levels remain the same. And within this, the specific uh, loan categories, we have 22,000 crores or 3.5 billion under secured farm credit, which is the standard lending model for farmers in India. We have another $1.5 billion of post-harvest credit to processors and intermediaries, warehouses. Some of this is brought together into the value chain where it is 1,000 crores of business as we speak today. The value chain evolved from what we started to put out in 2007, a rural payment bank. Uh, today, it, on the rural pa payment bank network, we have 10 lakh, uh, a million farmers enrolled for receiving payments into their bank accounts. And these are serviced uh, by about 2,000 business correspondents uh, across a range of product categories and, and deep geography rural. Farmers include value chains like dairy, seed production, fruit and vegetable, tea, poultry, and sugarcane. And here we have a trophy cupboard on the right. You can go through that. It's, it's an impressive trophy cupboard is in, and it it's keep, keeps growing and it will be on the website. So you should have a look at this as well. So that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and found it useful. And now we can uh, start the Q&A. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for, for a great presentation. So I am going to start. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions regarding um, site selling. Um, yes. I also wanted to start quickly, if you can go over a little bit, um, uh, just in, in, in uh, a little bit in terms of how do you identify the client? It, does HDFC has, uh, have a, a marketing strategy to, to market this product? How do you uh, identify the, the potential clients? And um, yeah, so, so basically, what is the bank strategy to identify new clients? Are they uh, existing clients, um, et cetera? OK, so how do we ex uh, select uh, the value chain that we want to play in. Say, for instance, in dairy, we, would, we are looking at, of course, existing relationships with uh, processors uh, like cooperatives, uh, the big dairy cooperatives, and uh, private sector players in this business. Within that, we start looking at the geographies that we want to play in, and we look at a couple of things like the general trend in that geography is the milk production growing is it stagnating because there's a we look at the cultural shifts that are happening in uh, milk producers there are certain communities that are getting out of milk 
production, certain communities getting into milk production, and historic data doesn't tell us that, so we look at how this is panning out for a particular geography. And then within that, we further drill down to the kind of uh, agents, uh, collection agents or collection um, cooperatives that we want to work with. And we align ourselves with the strategy, belt collection strategy of the off-takers. So if the off-takers are concentrating on developing a particular route, a route is the route followed by the milk truck, then that's, that's the way uh, we would also you know, concentrate on um, building those collection points. Of course, we would pick out others that make sense around them and also get a cluster going for ourselves. But that would pretty much be the guiding route uh, to go. The second question was, how do we uh, prevent site selling? Site selling is something that is uh, very rampant in agriculture. So the first thing to look at is the commodity. So perishables are less uh, likely to be uh, in, engaged in site selling because it is perishable. So they need to get it to the nearest collection point and dispose it off before it, it gets bad, which is not the case with, say, grains and rice and things like that. The second important point uh, here is uh, who has who holds the influence in this uh, setup? Sorry. The aggregator has commands a certain amount of influence in this rural ecosystem. And he has a hold on a set of farmers. And he has an idea who will size sell and who will not sell. He has an idea who he wants to develop for uh, be being a larger producer. And then he decides or he, he recommends those borrowers who, who would, uh, you know, most likely be the ones not to site sell to the bank for, for the loans. But the bank doesn't go purely by his recommendation. The bank would look at the track record of these farmers. Are they pouring consistently? Is the milk money coming consistently? And basis the volume of money coming in, what should be the loan amount for new cattle that he needs to purchase? So this is how the selection process works, or rather how it got evolved over, over a period of time. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so there are several questions that have just come in. And uh, one of the questions has to do with how the bank uh, factors the price fluctuation. Um, so the question goes like this. My question is how, they, how the bank factors in price uh, fluctuation in loan repayment, given that most off-takers pay differently depending on the supply. So they pay high when there is milk scarcity and less during the uh, during um, oversupply. So here's the thing. Uh, so far, the companies that we have worked uh, with have kind of padded in uh, the prices to keep their value chains going. For instance, the big cooperatives they pad it by paying out an annual bonus to the farmers for milk, uh, you know, uh, paid over the period. Now, should should there be a delinquency because of lower revenue coming into the farm farmers' account, then there is an offset against that bonus amount that is available as a last resort. But before that, we all, you know, the milk fluctuation is. Uh, maybe 20 30 percent year year to year but whereas the you know the haircuts applied on the cash flows are much larger so there is a trade-off between you know uh, collecting the installments and leaving some money with the farmers uh, to be able to feed the animals in the lean season so that's a relationship thing that we do uh, and allow the farmers uh, some amount of leeway the, the collection issue really comes uh, with farmers that don't genuinely take the loan and don't genuinely, uh, you know, perform the dairy activity uh, uh, as, as a serious, uh, you know, uh, as a serious activity. So those are easy to identify and there we, you know, we have to do a bit of a hard collection. But genuine farmers who have a problem, we have to play uh, uh, easing easy game out with them and collect when, when times are better. 
So that applies to all our agricultural business, whether secured or unsecured. We call it a promise to pay. So farmers who you can see the activity going on the ground, but they don't have the money to pay. There's no way you can collect. So we, you just have to wait till they're, they're able to pay. Great. Thank you. So the next question is um, uh, about aggregators. Um, so the, the participant is asking how many aggregators are co-ops and how many are individuals? And is there any difference in performance of co-ops and individual aggregators? Uh, good question. Right now, I think uh, the current uh, setup that we have about 60% is co-ops and the other 40% are individuals. Uh, the lending at this point in time would be almost 90% uh, through co-ops and 10% through individuals. The individuals started a bit late and now getting scaled up. So to be honest with you, right now the experience is largely with co-ops. Though the individual, the initial results on the individuals are not being so bad at all. And uh, yeah, within co-ops also, there is a kind of pseudo individualism that comes in in certain kinds of cooperatives where you have certain individuals who are larger than life running a cooperative. So uh, the individual aspects work both ways and have to be managed both either way. Great, thank you. So the next question is about the insurance and if you can explain a little bit more about uh, how it works within the dairy value chain context. Um, is it is it a requirement and is, is there a subsidy for those who, who cannot afford it or in general just how, how it works? So the insurance is like a credit shield on the animal. So in case anything happens to the animal and uh, milk production does not happen, the animal dies, uh, the insurance is used to pay off the loan and the balance amount goes to the farmers, point number one. Insurance is used to check the health of the animal when the farmer is purchasing it. So the, the veterinary doctor will go and check the animal and he would actually use his experience to tell, tell the customer and the bank how much should this really cost. So generally by rule we look at two lactation cycles, uh, not more than two lactation cycles to, you know, have, so that the person buying the animal has uh, you know, um, a lactating life of eight, ten years uh, going forward, and the loan is for three to four years, so it gets well covered. So insurance serves that aspect of valuation of the asset being purchased for the bank as well, and uh, it is uh, it is a must in in case of our model of lending. At this point in time, because there are not many organized players in the dairy sector. Uh, there is no subsidy available on the insurance side of it. Uh, the insur uh, sub there, there was some subsidy available on uh, purchase of animals, but, but that keeps changing and there's no uh, real central government subsidy on cattle at this point in time. There is a subsidy from the National Agricultural Bank that kicks in and kicks out uh, now and then and we have to just stay ahead of that curve and make sure that our borrowers get that. Okay, great. So th there was actually a related question just overall if there is any support from the government um, in, in this model and if there are any development partner, partners that you're working with uh, in terms of the dairy value chain. Uh, there's one in pipeline, not uh, already uh, on the ground, but the, yes, there's one development uh, aspect that's working in one of the states, and I'll be able to talk about it maybe six months from today. Okay, great. Um, so the other question um, that I received is uh, has to do with a with a cattle loan, and it, it's asking how do you control the investment when you do a cattle loan. Um, I'm not sure if that's clear. Uh, I, I presume that is a question on how do we know that the money is being used to purchase the cattle uh, or a set of animals. Yes. So that, that check is uh, the insurance health certificate that comes to the bank. So when a farmer decides he wants to buy two or three cattle, uh, he, he identifies the cattle, he pays a small advance to the seller, 
and brings the cattle to his farm the insurance uh, vet veterinary doctor goes checks the animals issues a health certificate to the bank the bank says okay good to go we can finance these then he tags the animals and issues the insurance certificate and then the disbursement is done and the insurance premium collected so that way we may, uh, you know the end use that the money is going uh, to the farmer for purchase of cattle is insured Great. So I will have to go back to the insurance one more time. Uh, there is a question whether there is specialized insurance for cattle in India, and uh, if yes, who provides this insurance? Yes, there is uh, specialized insurance for cattle in India. Uh, it is provided by uh, quite a few insurance companies, uh, public sector and private sector. but it is a general uh, policy uh, we are trying to fine tune it for different breeds and different varieties uh, between cow and buffalo because each has a different mortality experience or statistic in a different part of the country so certain varieties perform well you know india has five different climatic zones so certain breeds perform better in certain geographies and that's how uh, cattle purchase happens by uh, farmers and uh, you know this is an understanding that has to come in with the insurance firms and and basis the data that we provide we are trying to bring down that cost uh, by providing more specialized insurance basis the performance of those specific breeds in those specific geographies Great. So the next question is uh, about uh, the possibility of replicating this model for the perishable produce. Uh, it's asking what what would you see as the uh, main challenges in replicating this model for the per perishable produce? So the main challenge in replicating this model for uh, perishable produce is uh, getting the right paperwork. from the aggregators and being able to assess the aggregators because because of perishability like if you take vegetables for instance uh, because they are perishable the aggregators don't hold inventories uh, they have to sell off all the stock collected on the same day and because they don't hold inventories they don't have books of accounts so that is a key challenge uh, we are trying to find some work arounds of that we have started a few and we learn uh, you know through those experiences on uh alternate ways of uh, evaluating aggregator uh, performances uh, uh, you know in in vegetable chains having said that in in things like tea small tea growers uh, seed production hybrid seed production the well established value chains and those are already underway so we don't have a problem with those ones the the one we want to really develop is the vegetable value chain which is uh, much more disorganized in nature in india compared to the dairy value chain and has a huge potential for development so um the next question um is a question that has to do with a uh with a bank account being used for their cash flows cash movements so it's asking uh how can uh how do you convince farmers dairy farmers and their chain players to use the bank for their cash movements that uh, has become a whole lot easier with the central government's uh, drive to drive on financial inclusion so opening an account is not as difficult as it used to be when we started back in uh, 2007 so in in the india context uh, that has become super easy thanks to the drive by the prime minister himself on financial inclusion what we call the jandhan yojana okay uh so the the other question has to do with uh um is asking when markets are assured and payment is directly banked farmers risk profile is lower is this factored in the interest rate uh yes and no uh, it's factored uh on the risk premium but the operating cost uh, you know uh, kicks in so the average price uh, comes uh, somewhere around 11 to 12% which is significantly lower than the informal sector that is currently operating 
So there are many, many questions that have come in, and I'm uh, uh, going through them uh, one by one. So I hope we will have enough time to answer all of them. If not, we'll go back to uh, connecting on LinkedIn for those of you who are unable to get their answers today. Um, so one of the questions um, uh, is, in the case where processors does the collection himself directly from farmers, does the Oh, the, actually, this one is already addressed, sorry. Uh, so what is the value proposition for banks in implementing value chain finance product, and what are the main challenges specifically in the dairy value chain? I so guess I'll, I'll go back a couple of slides. So I'll go back to the second slide. Where, so you see this 83% is the market that is available. It is the underserved market uh, for any bank or financial company. Now, putting together a payment mechanism for this and putting together a value chain and bringing in all the digital pieces to work together, you, you have the possibility of a full-blown fintech uh, revolution in uh, using value chains. But it doesn't stop there. You have to take a look at this slide. Is You have a, a great cross-sell opportunity to this set of borrowers. Uh, you can collect deposits. You can do a whole lot of other credit. And then in the same area that these depositors uh, exist, there are other customers who you can tap because you get a certain amount of understanding of this ecosystem. You have a cash, cash in, cash out point to a business correspondent who over a time becomes like a bank employee, like a branch manager. So this, and this is our experience, by the way. So this whole ecosystem starts generating a lot of value in, in, a, in a rural market. So this is the, you know, the motivation to do this. Having worked on it, it has come to a level where it makes sense uh, doing this going forward. Great. Thank you. Um, so the question uh, that I, I will read now relates to an earlier question that I asked about uh, how does HDFC identify clients. And it builds on it by asking what kind of producers do not make good clients. And uh, for example, uh, who would you deny entry into this, uh, into this scheme? Uh, that's a good, another good question. Uh, we would look at somebody who, for dairy farming, who's progressive in dairy farming, someone who wants to grow his herd size, and somebody who's, uh, Income from dairy is a significant part of the household income. So by significant, I would say about 40%, 50%. If there is a family that earns just 5 or 10% revenue from dairy and the rest of the revenue comes from regular crops, then we would not prefer to do uh, unsecured cattle finance for that kind of a profile. We rather do a secured profile, a secured credit for his other crops and build in a cattle loan under that. So that's how we balance this out. Okay, great. So you, you also talked about the role of aggregators in the model. And one of the question um, is, what is the incentive for aggregators to work with HDFC Bank? Uh, and have you faced resistance from lobbies of existing informal sources of finance? Uh, so if you can talk a, a little bit about that. Oh yes, a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance from informal sources of finance. A lot of the time, the aggregators themselves are, uh, you know, party to this informal finance and there's a lot of resistance. I would say, you know, our success rate of conversion of aggregators has moved up from 30%, uh, a 30% hit rate uh, three or four years ago to almost 50% today. So 50% of the aggregators uh, are willing to work today when we go and approach them. Thank you, Michael. So um, this will be one of the one of the few last questions, uh, and it's asking about uh, whether competition for limited milk volumes by various off takers in a given region affects 
the former loyalty to a particular optaker or processor. So it's a it's a related question to site selling. What was was there any lesson when farmers site selling before or farmers site site selling before um, uh, and after becoming becoming loyal after the introduction of the scheme? So I guess the, the question is how does the introduction of the scheme uh, contribute to uh, farmer loyalty or to the to the reduction of risk in site selling? Uh, can this be el elaborated a little bit more as to the reasons why? think this scheme helped with that. Uh, you probably have met, have already touched on this uh, a lot, but maybe just uh, add a few more reasons. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, generally speaking, I don't have data to back this up at this point in time. But, uh, you know, the borrowers that we have lent money to, the numbers of borrowers that have then, uh, you know, become delinquent due to site selling. If I look at that statistic, it was very low. Uh, borrowers have been, become delinquent for other reasons, which is uh, uh, other than dairy. So site selling, I would say, uh, get does get reduced uh, by uh, getting attached to the system. Now, before they borrow, are they still open to site selling? Uh, probably yes. But uh, I don't have adequate data, but we do look at the consistency of the cash flow of a borrower before we give him the loan. So uh, people who are not prone to site selling, uh, which is reflected by, you know, the st uh, stability of the cash flows, uh, generally get the loan. So I think both these uh, two items play out together. Great. So just, uh, I think this is the last question as we also are getting close to, to the end of the webinar. Uh, but it, it relates to the, uh, I, I just got in, it relates to the question that uh, you asked previously about the aggregators. And uh, it says that 50% conver uh, uh, conversion is impressive. Could you please shed some light on what factors help HDFC convince aggregators already doing our informal finance at a, high, at, at a much higher rate to move to HDFC? I think uh, the answer to that uh, I would put down to, you know, word of mouth of aggregators that like the model uh, and word of mouth that happens when the off taker call, calls for these big uh, meetings of uh, collection agents and things like that. So the word of mouth, word of mouth of a good experience is what really I think uh, uh, carries the day for us in this aspect. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. I think we've come to uh, the end. There's, uh, I think we've managed to address all of the questions. Um, and it's, it's been really wonderful to, to hear you share your experience. And I, I thank you for, for taking the time to, to do this. So thanks again. And we hope it's a that... Pleasure. We'll, we'll continue to do this in the future on uh, on other subjects and other other business lines with HDFC as well. Um, well certainly. So thanks so much, Michael. And uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that, as always, we will make the recording of the webinar uh, and and the PowerPoint presentation available on Agrofin's website uh, within the next uh, couple of days. We will also send it send an email to everyone. Who, who joined today to let them know that they're available. Um, so I also wanted to ask you if you can fill out the, the survey that I'm going to open right now um, and, and just let us know what you thought about the webinar and uh, this will really help us uh, understand better whether these webinars uh, are, are adding value to your work. So that would be great. Um, and uh, in the meantime, if you have any remaining questions, um, I, I would encourage you to join the Agrofin uh, LinkedIn group that we launched uh, just recently. There's already 200 members that have joined in, in less than uh, two weeks. And the objective of the group is to facilitate additional exchange um, after the webinars, but in general, more broadly, among Agrofin, um, the Agrofin community. Uh, so we've already posted a link in the chat box earlier. Uh, I'm going to do it again now so that you can click on it and, and just ask to join.
Um, we also have another webinar coming up on May 24th. Uh, this, is feature, this features uh, recent research by our colleagues at CGAP on financial diaries of smallholder families. Um, so the webinar presentation will, will talk about, will focus on what financial service providers can learn from, from the, these research findings in order to better understand smallholder clients and decide, design appropriate financial solutions. Um, so you can register uh, for this webinar. The registration is open on Agrican website. I will also post shortly a link to the registration page as well. Um, and once again, I, I just wanted to thank you all for joining and thank you, Michael. And we'll, we'll be in touch and we'll continue to share uh, lessons from, from um, around the world that uh, that will add value. So thank, thank you. you. See you in, in the next webinar. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.